Hi there. Welcome to Visual Storytelling with Christy Ray Wilson. I want to thank the Octavia Flynn Library um, for asking me to contribute to this event. And I hope you enjoy what I have um, to share with you today. So my name is Christy and I currently teach at the University of New Mexico in Gallup. Uh, I've been here for um, just about eight years. I teach uh, the jewelry class as well as drawing and art history. And um, in addition to that, I also make jewelry. So um, today I'm gonna kind of walk you through um, how I became an artist and how I came to understand um, storytelling within my work. And I also wanna share some of my student work with you um, today. So first, um, I actually went to undergrad at Stephen F. Austin State University. That's in one of the oldest towns in Texas. Um, uh, that's Nacogdoches, Texas. And while I was here, I had a wonderful instructor named Jennifer Schultes, and she introduced um, her students to um, this new te technology called CAD CAM. And here on the left, you're seeing one of her images that are, act it's actually designed in a computer and then created uh, through technology um, to make this one of a kind um, piece here. In addition to that, she um, introduced me to um, Art Nouveau and she also taught a class on the history of craft. And it was there that I was influenced by William Morris, um, who was the founder of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and here's a, a book showing um, some of his really famous wallpaper designs. So you can kind of see this influence in some of my um, beginning work when I was in undergrad. Um, some of those um, curvilinear shapes. And uh, here you're seeing um, on the right copper and silver. This is a brooch. And there's three different um, areas with open um, tube rivets um, that allow you to wear it. And then on the left, you're seeing a silver plexiglass, a flower. And um, this um, part right here on the uh, bottom right, it actually opens. And so you can slide this through the garment and then close that up. So just kind of learning basic um, skills in uh, the metals class, the jewelry class, learning how things affix to the body, playing with form and shape. Um, you can see there's hydraulic press forming where you can actually push the metal up. And this is used as well here in the other one. Um, and then rivets where you can um, drill holes and then attach these pieces together with um, tube rivets. In addition to that, um, she was actually the first teacher that asked us um, to tell a story um, through a jewelry piece. And um, no one had ever asked me to do that before. It was really exciting. And so I, I explored the three generations of um, the, my uh, family on the female side. And so here is a, a, an image that I printed in the upper left um, corner here of my grandma when she was a young girl. And I printed that on fabric and then riveted that to a silver um, formed piece. And then here is a medium sized piece of silver that has an image of my mom when she was a young girl. And then the smallest one is an image of myself. And there's some text on this bottom part here. So the brooch comes apart completely as seen here in the upper left. And then on the right, you can see how each one stacks um, and has um, a pearl uh, between each, each layer. Uh, and I'm trying to see. Um, this part right here um, actually has a long, um, sharp uh, stem on it. And so this goes on the very bottom and uh, it goes through all these pieces and then this little um, resin set um, open tube piece kind of closes it. So that's how it stays together. Here you can see it a little better in this other one. This is an image of my aunt, Aunt Juanita, 
um, who had actually passed away when I was in undergrad. And so I made a, a, a brooch to memorialize her. And um, this one goes, so you would insert this under the garment and then um, it would push through the garment and then this would lay, this actually closes, and then you would actually insert a, um, a flower, like a stem of a rose on the top. So you would um, see that through the front. You'd see this piece in the rose. This is actually um, exploring with the same kind of biomorphic shape. Um, and this is actually a nightlight. Um, so we also explored not only jewelry, but objects, um, functional objects. And so this would insert into the wall and um, there are these images of um, the ocean um, that come through here. Uh, the last semester, the last year of my undergrad experience, um, Jennifer Schultes actually um, moved. Um, she got a job at Tiffany and Company. And so she, um, so she accepted that job. And we got this really awesome teacher named Natalia Pinchuk, who was from Russia originally. And uh, she was very, very influential um, to, to um, my art making practice. And so here you can see an, an image of her work that incorporates wool and um, enameled metal on the right, and that's a brooch. And one thing that she did um, that really influenced uh, me was she showed us a video of um, this film called um, The Gleaners. It was by this French um, director, Agnes Varda, who's here on the bottom right. And it talks about how, um, it talks about contemporary gleaning. So here you're seeing a, a painting up above of um, uh, individuals, you know, picking up the, the leftovers from, from a harvest, okay? And this is the, the term to glean. And um, her documentary um, talks about modern day gleaning where you can take um, objects um, that maybe are discarded um, in society and reuse them in some kind of way. And so uh, if you haven't seen this film, I highly recommend it. It, it was very, very influential to my art. Natalia also introduced me to this artist named Otto Kunzli, and um, his work talked about trust. And so, and the, this is Otto on the right with his um, um, his box um, jewelry on the right, and then on the left, this is a piece of his where he took a piece of. Um, in the inside, it's actually gold, but it, but he encased it. Um, this is a bracelet with rubber, and so. You have to kind of, there's a level of trust um, with this piece. You have to really believe that this artist actually put um, gold underneath um, this piece. So he kind of takes, um, you know, non-traditional materials, um, things that you wouldn't think about using um, for, for jewelry. Because when you think of jewelry, you think of it as being very precious, you know, being silver or gold. And so he's kind of playing with this concept of, of what is valuable. Um, I also was introduced to one of my favorite artists, Louise, um, Louise Bourgeois, um, who is very famous for her sculptures, um, large scale kind of like um, spider sculptures. Um, and she also talks about familial ro roles um, regarding to her family um, in her work. But on the right, she had this really radical wearable art piece um, that really moved me when I was an undergrad. Um, just thinking about, you know, forms and really pushing the boundaries of, you know, what is normal in terms of what we wear and how we wear that in public. And um, another, the last artist that really influenced me during this time was um, Klaus Oldenburg, um, and specifically his uh, soft sculptures, where he would take an everyday object, such as a toilet, <laughs> seen here on the left, and he would actually turn, make it into a sculpture for a museum, um, but it would be soft. So I really enjoyed kind of the sense of humor that he had and, um, and how he would take something that normally you would think of as, as durable and make that soft. And so for my, at the end of the semester for undergrad, um, we have what's called an artist, um, 
a thesis show. And so um, you take a body of work that you've, you've worked out and then you exhibit that. And so um, I ended up uh, making a series of uh, wearable pieces and object um, that, and an object that talk about um, idioms, these kind of play on words. And so, um, for example, the second image is the straw that broke the camel's back. And so this is a small pin that you would wear. Um, this is the second from the image from the left. It's a thin tube. Um, of uh, brass, brass tube that has a pin back mechanism and there's a long piece of straw on that. Um, another one is uh, home is where the heart is. And so this is a brooch that's actually um, a metal, um, it looks kind of like a metal cookie cutter essentially and that goes under the shirt and then this insert of this fabric uh, pushes in and it stays. So, um, this was one of the first times that I actually um, thought of using fabric with metal and, and exploring how that could be worn on the body. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, this is a series of um, cans, um, aluminum cans that repeats over and over until it, um, comes forward and it's set in a silver backing. Um, so this was, you know, my reference to Otto Kunzli, you know, taking something non-precious, just like a can, and then um, setting that into silver. And you can, you can barely see the silver until you take the piece off. Wearing one's, um, what is that saying? Wearing one's emotions on your sleeve. You wear your emotions on your sleeve. So this is a box. <laughs> this is a box that um, attaches to your sleeve and then you can pull out a little um, tissue, little um, paper. And I'm forgetting what this one <laughs> was because it was so long ago. Um, I think it was something along the lines of um, something about a silver spoon. Um, but kind of playing on that, um, that notion. And what I did was I actually took a silver spoon and I cut it down in half and then soldered it to a bigger spoon and just kind of like played with that. So one, the project that really influenced me the most when I was taking the, my final course from Natalia she brought in a um, paper bag for each of the students, the advanced students, and she put a found material that she had uh, picked up from like Goodwill. And the project was to make a necklace that um, out of that material, um, to really uh, research that material and see, see what it could do and, um, and make a necklace that would wow her, okay? So I opened my bag and I got, um, uh, eight track tape, which those of you who don't know what eight track tape is, um, it is, you know, if you think of like a CD, before CDs, we had um, tape players. And before that, it was eight track. And so it looked like a little box and it would insert into your stereo here and it would play, you know, um, it'd play a few songs, right? <laughs> So the material in which the, um, the songs are recorded on um, is this material here. So um, what I did was I removed all of the recording material and started to fold it. And it was actually very durable. Um, what I did was I folded into this kind of fauna shape and then um, got a, a rubber hose um, from the car parts store and um, cut a little slit and inserted it and then um, I, I made a fixture out of metal um, where you could actually fasten the back. And so this is the piece, um, I believe the tape was called Mom and Pops, Mom and Pops Waltzes. So this is Mom and Pops Waltzes necklace. And as you move, um, they actually gently kind of like um, bounce a little bit. And so it's, it's quite an elegant um, piece. And you can really see that influence of, you know, I was thinking about Art Nouveau, I was thinking about um, 
about a Coonsley um, and thinking about how you could take um, this non-precious material and really uh, um, elevate it. And I still have this piece today and it, it's, it's uh, held up very strong, you know, and the cool thing about it is you don't have to polish it like you would um, silver and so forth. So, but I actually applied to a show, um, I applied to an exhibition and um, not an exhibition, I'm sorry. I applied to um, a scholarship um, through the Society of North American Goldsmiths. Um, I had participated in a, in a um, um, uh, scholarship and I won. And um, I used that money to travel to the Netherlands um, when I graduated from undergrad um, to study with this crazy guy <laughs> depicted on the left here, very famous um, artist in the Netherlands named Root Peters. And um, this is some of his work on the right. And um, the workshop, you know, was in this, we would, you know, ride our bikes out to this barn <laughs> onto Root's property. And what he did was he, um, we had this series of projects and one of them was um, there was a whole row of trees on the street. And this was like a small, you know, town in, um, you know, like a, a farming town. And um, anyways, it was a, ro a road with some trees and we each got a tree and we, we drew the tree, we studied the tree for a couple of days and then Root asked us to offer something to this tree. And we were all jewelers, you know, and we were asked to not bring any tools. So we could only use what was available, um, the vernacular of the area. And so anyways, I started studying my tree and I noticed that my tree had a, had a gash down below and it was missing a large branch. And um, so what I did was I asked um, some local people, you know, hey, do you know what happened to this tree? And they said, oh, a, a truck was coming down um, hauling some large material and it, it hit that tree and it ripped off a huge branch. And so what I decided to do was to use the leaves of the tree um, that had fallen and uh, create a hearing device for that tree so that if if harm would come its way, at least it could, you know, be prepared in some way. It could, it could amplify that that sound and so um, there were some you know some materials available in the studio and so I took a piece of uh, plexiglass and attached that um, to a wooden um, component down at the bottom and um, covered it um, hot glued um, leaves all the way around it and then towards the end of the um, the uh, workshop, I uh, created a hearing device for myself. And so it, because I used the leaves of the tree, um, it only made sense that the leaves, um, if I correlated that to the body, that would be my hair. So I actually asked a uh, root to uh, give me a little haircut, as you can see here. <laughs> and um, I used some of my hair to actually um, felt um, using wool felt um, this hearing device for myself. And um, the part of this project was we had to team up with someone else in the workshop and we had to offer um, a, a material that they had never worked with before. So I was given wool. Um, and so I was trying to figure out um, how to incorporate wool into a piece of uh, wearable art. You can see in the background there, we have each had a table where whatever our material was, we um, could investigate that material. And um, it was kind of like our little scientist um, <laughs> research um, area. So after that um, experience, I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school um, to explore making art a little bit more. And so I was accepted to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And this is where I was introduced to a wonderful instructor named Billy Thidey. Um, and this is one of her pieces on the right here. Um, highly decorative uh, teapot that's actually influenced um, by um, some of the uh, Southwest formations. Um, and uh, I believe that she used um, you know, 
motorcycle paint um, to have the, these fixtures after they were formed um, out of metal and then soldered together, uh, uh, painted with a professional um, motorcycle uh, paint. Um, I was in Urbana-Champaign, which is a pretty small college town, um, but just close to that was Chicago, um, where um, at the Art Institute, this instructor and very famous artist, Nick, uh, Nick Cave, worked. And I was influenced and saw an exhibition of his really famous uh, sound suits, where he would hand bead um, these uh, these sound suits that um, performers would wear and then um, at the opening exhibition they would dance in them. So highly decorative um, ornamentation. I was also introduced to um, Eva Hess um, uh, who incorporates um, soft sculpture um, into her work. Um, installation view there on the right. It's kind of biomorphic shapes. And while I was um, here as a graduate student, you obviously take courses, but you have to teach. And so I was, um, these, this is some of my student work um, where you have to teach them, you know, just basic soldering. Um, and so this was a linear bracelet that they had to make using a bracelet using line. And so I just showed them how to make real basic shapes, circles, squares, um, and just using line. And uh, they had to um, solder these together. And obviously we're playing with positive and negative space. Um, we did a ring project um, where they had to explain, explore planes, um, so, so flat areas. Um, and so here on the left, you're seeing a chess piece that's a hollow construction. And then you insert the finger there and then it has a, um, um, the, another chess piece down at the bottom that's um, flat. The image on the right um, actually makes a beautiful sound of the metal when you um, wear that. Um, you can obviously wear it upside down. Um, so these would be hanging on uh, below the, the ring finger. Another project um, I taught was uh, making basic um, brooches that explored texture. So using hammers, using um, etching techniques, um, acid baths, uh, pat patination, which is the coloration of metal, um, and looking at, you know, non-objective forms, so forms that aren't recognizable, um, um, just exploring, you know, the beauty of form and texture and shape and plane. You can see these are raised up, so they're using that riv rivet technique. So I was also introduced to Ted Noten, um, very famous Dutch artist um, who, who, I love this piece. He took an entire Mercedes Benz and he cut it into you know, hundreds of pieces and turned those little tiny pieces into um, uh, brooches. And I just thought this was you know, one of the coolest projects ever because it talk about value. You, know, you take something that's so expensive and then you cut it and then you, you, you're just left with this simple shape from this, this object that is, you know, not only functional, but very expensive and, and valuable. And, um, and each person kind of gets a little bit of that value. So I decided in graduate school to take my car, um, a Nissan Sentra, uh, and um, completely um, take it apart a socket wrench and a screwdriver. And so I spent one summer um, taking the entire car apart. So you can see in grad school, something that became very influential to me was a deconstruction, taking something um, and taking that apart. So I took each piece apart and photographed it. And this is all the nuts and bolts that were left on the right. And that's the um, timing chain on the left there. And when I got down to that part, I kind of knew that that was it. That was kind of, in terms of if, if a car was a body, I was thinking of it as like, it's heart, you know, it had stopped beating. So um, so it was time to kind of stop that project. So I had the, the car crushed and salvaged so it could be reused for parts. And um, after I graduated, I moved to Houston, Texas, where I was accepted to um, a residency program 
um, at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And while I was there, I also got a part-time job at the store um, called Buffalo Exchange. And while I was there, I made many friends and I um, used the influence of that part-time job into my studio practice and had an exhibition. Um, and so what I did, um, because I was surrounded by clothing, um, I had, um, I had uh, been thinking about fiber a lot. And so what I did was I, um, someone had given me a, a random bag of scrap fabric and um, I decided to investigate that. So I separated it into similar color, shape, and size. And then I also took my scrap silver from undergrad and um, placed that in shape and size as well and started to um, look at these forms and start to create um, wearable art with them. So this is a necklace using scrap fiber and scrap silver. This is on the body. And so this series is called Intentions of an Anonymous Quilter. So it's kind of like taking someone's unfinished project. There were little notes in the bag, you know, that they had every intention to finish this project and I guess they just didn't. And so um, this was a way to kind of, to kind of create closure and to finish that. And so these are all brooches necklace. And so with this one, I did actually fabricate silver components, rings, looking at color and shape and form. This is the brooch. And so you can see that's the same technique from undergrad where you're layering um, forms. So this is actually a soldered disc. And then another one that has holes in it where I was able to kind of push that fiber through. Those of you who, who make jewelry, you might know, this is a die cut, I'm cutting out circles that I use to make little, um, you know, you can eventually turn those scrap discs into, into um, form them into uh, spheres, actually. And so I always wanted to, to make a piece, for some reason, I was always really interested in making a piece for the shoulder. And so this one um, kind of hangs down from the shoulder here. And so while I was at Buffalo Exchange, the, the um, manager, um, um, I, I collaborated with her and I asked her, you know, if they, if she could donate, the store could donate a material to me to make a piece of jewelry out of. And she said, yeah, that sounds really cool. And she had said, you know, if you want to have an exhibition here, we can, we can do that. And so we ended up doing that. It was pretty awesome, actually. So this is a dress that they donated. And then this is my transformation of that dress into a necklace. And so that show um, got got a lot of exposure in Houston. Um, Houston's a really great um, community for supporting artists. Um, and so there was, a, uh, it was just kind of shocking. There was a newspaper article <laughs> that came out and it was on the front page, that, that piece. And so that's me standing there. I was walking down the street one day and on everyone's front, front, um, front yard, <laughs> I saw this piece, it was, pretty crazy. And um, there's another write-up of the greats and grands, which I'll get to now. So I did another project um, that has a lot to do with storytelling, actually. Um, I decided to ask people in the community to donate fabric um, from um, individuals who had like kind of cultivated a some type of craft in their home. And, um, and with their permission, I could transform that, um, that those scrap materials into an homage to those, those, um, those figures. So it ended up being, you know, grand, either it was someone's grandma or great grandma. And so um, 
this necklace on the left is quite large. You can see the scale a little bit better on the right um, there where you would wear it and it would actually drag on the ground. And so the idea is creating this um, larger than life kind of homage to Graham. This series is called Greats and Grands. And it's to celebrate those, those um, figures in our life that's, that um, either sewed or um, created some type of craft in your home with fiber. And so what I did was I hired uh, this wonderful lady um, from Ireland who lived in, in Houston and she interviewed each of these ind individuals and we did recordings. So here is um, you know, the MP3 player and then here's the headset. So you would sit in the chair and listen to the story about this figure um, so I believe this grandma was named Effie. Yeah, Effie. And it was a really interesting story um, from her, from her fabrics. And this was Dora, Dora's scrap. And so I turned this into a necklace. And then the third one was actually um, one of my own grandmother's pieces. This is a table runner that she embroidered um, of pheasants. And um, you wear it on the shoulder. And this is a toothpick holder of a bird. There's a silver connection connector here. So here's just a little snippet of um, the interview. So I, I asked my dad to um, tell this story about um, um, grandma. So this is what you would hear if you were sitting in the chair and viewing this piece. I'm here with Gary Wilson, it's Christy's father, and we're going to talk today about Viola, isn't that right? Viola. Your Viola. mother. She was from Sweet Home, Texas. Okay. And my dad, he was from George West. Uh -huh. And they both moved to Houston. And she worked at Continental Can Company, and he worked at a gas station down the street. Well, then she got, she would go home from work every evening through that gas station. And uh, that's how they met. But she got him a job at Continental Can Company after a while, so. But I thought that was kind of a love story, you know. So it is. <laughs> but they, she was from Sweet Home, Texas. Yeah. And he was from George West. Mm -hmm. And let's see, her, she just, she didn't have a middle name, it was just Viola Brennick. So, uh, well, she would take us all to the cemetery and feed the ducks and the Houston Zoo to feed the ducks. And she'd get us out there in the cemetery and nobody would be out there. Well, she'd teach us how to drive the car, you know. <laughs> we were just kids, you know. We'd break off a little bread, and after a while, we had all the ducks in the car trying to take them home. So, <laughs> so you brought, did you get any home with you? Yeah, well, every once in a while, one or two. We had them in the backyard. She was a wonderful cook. Was she? Oh, she was a great cook. On the street and smell her frying chicken, you know. She used to just fry chicken. She, she was a good cook, though. Yeah. And had gravy with every meal, you know. It was very distinctive. They, 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 uh, they just don't make chicken like hers anymore. But it was real good, yeah. She would go out in the garage and we made her a quilting frame and she would uh, just, you know, four boards with the clamps. And she'd sit out there in the morning and the evening and uh, sew on her quilt, you know, her quilts. Was there any she, particular pattern that you... No, she just used just old scraps and stuff, you know. But she made all the all the boys, uh, you know, quilt and all that. She'd take us all to church Sunday, you know, and after that go feed the ducks. <laughs> but we'd rip, uh, we'd rip all the, we'd uh, undress all the suits and we had our change of clothes in the car, you know. And off, to the zoo, off to the zoo we'd go to feed the ducks, you know. How many boys were there? Five. Wow. Yeah. She had four sisters, though. Yeah. It was, I see. What was it? Jane, Eva, Judy, and Helen. And Helen. 
And then you five boys. And then Viola herself, and then she had us five boys, yeah. Mm. Did she teach you to sew? She did. <laughs> she uh, taught me to sew a button, you know, on the shirt. And, woo, wait. <laughs> what? Just talking about her, you know. Yeah, it brings back memories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She taught you to sew buttons on shirts. That's very useful for guys to know how to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she put everybody's name on it. She embroidered everybody's name on it, you know. Wow. So it was pretty neat. Yeah. So you had your name on the bottom of the coat. Full name? Yeah. Still have that, you know. Do you? Yeah. Your brothers still have those? Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, the the names kind of wore off, wore off, you know. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Just thinking about this. Yeah, oh. I, have a, I have a quilt. Baby quilt. Your baby quilt. That wow. I still use. I played the violin, and you know, she take me to them orchestra meetings and all that, you know. She sit there and listen to all that, you know. <laughs> and did the other, did your brothers play instruments? Yeah, James, he played the guitar, and Harold played the accordion, and Larry played the drums. I see what else about Mom and Harold. But she, well, she didn't just make quilts for the whole family and stuff like that. She done that like a hobby, you know. And this little doll, I guess. You've seen some of them dolls. They're, she taught me how to make them. They were uh, they're, they're just, out of yarn. They were angels, I think. She liked to sew, you know, on the sewing machine. And that's how she finished in quilts and all that, you Yeah. Know? But she made the dolls and she made, what else did you say she made? She made dolls and... And purses, just purses. And hand purses, you know. Well, you did she sell things or did she? No, she didn't sell them. She just just kind of gave them to people. She had four sisters, yeah. so she had to just about raise all of them. <laughs> so, that, so that's where she learned to cook and sew. So, but uh, I called one of her sisters uh, and <clears throat> and asked her if she knew how to make you know gravy. And she goes, <laughs> she said, No, uh, Viola was the only one that did that. I always had a big Christmas, you know, just big tree and all that, you know. But it was real nice. She told me around Christmas that when she was growing up, when she was a little girl, she didn't grow up during the Depression. Did she grow up during the Depression? Yeah. Okay, she yeah. said during the Depression there were these little dolls that they would pass out. They were angels, so mm -hmm. you could take a piece of cardboard and wrap it a certain amount of times around the cardboard one way and then wrap it around the other way and that would be the body and then the legs. Oh. And then if you just cut the bottom, it would be an angel. But if you attach the two legs separately, then it would be a boy angel, be like girl angel or boy angel. She would take a, a handkerchief and, you know, knot it up somehow and it looked like a squirrel and she flip it up, you know, with kids and stuff like that, you know. I remember she had like a big purse, but the only thing that was in the purse was that handkerchief. And maybe, so I don't think she kept any money in there, it was just that handkerchief. She could do anything with that handkerchief. Yeah. <laughs> Same lot, seriously. Yeah. She could clean something. I remember that squirrel entertain us. She was embroidery, yeah. Just embroidery a lot with that ring and stuff, you know, like pillowcases and stuff like that. This, yeah, flowers and stuff like that. Yeah, flowers. And we're looking at, what we're looking at is a beautiful, it looks like it's, are they, fe is that a pheasant? Mm -hmm. A pheasant and a... But is that the, is that the, um, is that one of them patterns though? Or is that, I think that's a pattern probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's see, she had Larry, he was Cheeto, and then she had me, Sweet Yuri, but see, I was so little, I'd say feet. <laughs> and I'd come up there and I'd say, uh, she'd go, well, come here, Sweet Yuri, 
and I go, come here, Gary. And I go, no, I'm not Gary, I'm on feet, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, she said they'd all, when they, when they were kids, they'd, they'd all take their bath at the creek every Saturday, you know. And went to the old school, the schoolhouse, you know, so. Uh, yeah, sweet home, Texas, just out, out in an old house on a hill, you know. Up here. And so um, I started to appreciate um, uh, making work um, that required collaboration. And so this is a project I did with my dad um, where he had, he had told me he went and got his, his income taxes done and they gave him a, a, free, a bunch of free shirts. And so that's the image on the upper left, the Liberty Tax Service. But he wanted a pocket on the shirt. And so um, he kind of took a brown pocket from another shirt and just kind of like, as you can see the detail on the bottom, right, just Frankenstein stitched that pocket onto it to make it functional. And I just thought that was hilarious. And, um, and uh, he wore it, you know, and so I, so I took a shirt that was given to me after teaching um, a summer art camp. And then I took a, a pocket off of one of my shirts and then I sewed it just to kind of explore that connection. And so um, I would eventually start taking some of these fabrics and, um, and using the fabrics to etch onto um, silver to make um, earrings. So I started kind of, you know, coming back to that, that material and, and showing the influence, the memory of that fabric on, on the metal. And so, um, I then moved um, to Gallup to begin teaching uh, around eight years ago at the University of New Mexico uh, in Gallup here. And, um, you know, I continue to explore uh, metal and fabric. This is a series I did um, with a, a student of mine, um, Cody, um, who um, donated some fabric and I was able to transform some of these into a brooch. And um, these are other just, you know, just me playing with different forms and, and playing with color and form and texture and fabric and metal. These are some earrings that I've made using fabric and metal. And while I've been here, I've been lucky enough to um, teach and have such wonderful students. This is an um, image of a student work on the right, Nathan Boone, an image on the left by Austin Gaddy. And these are brooches that explore texture. The one on the right is influenced by um, nature. Uh, Maya Ross, um, her brooch on the left, um, de depicting you know the rib cage here, and exploring riveting and texture and color. We also do forming. This is a bowl on the right by Charmaine um, Arviso, I believe is her last name. Um, taking a flat sheet of metal and forming that to the round. Here's another one that was actually on the left uh, that was silver plated. And then a brooch on the right influenced by nautical um, imagery from a ship, brass and copper. This was a wonderful student of mine, uh, Monty Thompson, who made a squat, his version of a squash blossom necklace that he hand fabricated in class. and showed him how to make those uh, round, where you take a flat piece of metal and you know form that to a curve and then you can make a sphere. So all his spheres that he made, his hollow construction there on the right. He actually graduated from uh, UNM Gallup and transferred over to main campus. And he recently, <laughs> he recently graduated um, with an art degree. Here's some more student work of hollow form constructions or rings on the right and then spoons um, on the left that we actually forge and forge from um, a silver rod of metal. And so most recently we had, um, uh, you know, the pandemic. <laughs> and so um, when I had to teach, when I was, you know, trying to figure out how to teach jewelry on, online, um, I decided to do that same project that Natalia Pinchuk had given me when I was an undergrad, um, where you take the material and transform it. 
And my students, some of the materials I gave them were fabric, um, plastic bags, and uh, another student, um, a lot of them had to use materials they had from home. I wasn't able to like put them in a bag. They had to just find things from home. So another student used vines from a wisteria plant. And so this link here um, is, uh, uh, takes you to um, Ethical Metalsmiths, which is a really great um, um, community that, of jewelers. And um, this is some of the work they made. This is from the vine. This is Kenneth. Kenneth made this piece. And here we have uh, two more pieces by students. And uh, Jacob Largo here. Um, these are made from the Walmart bags. And so um, it was happy sharing, you know, my art with you and, and talking about how I incorporate visual storytelling. And um, if you would like to check out more of my work, you can find that at uh, www.krawilson.com. Thanks and have a great day.